on the last episode of vlogging. Okay, no, don't don't worry about it. We're not gonna do a recap. This isn't actually Game of Thrones. On the last episode, I was talking a little bit about the idea of subversion and reversion and how they have to have context, but on this one, we're actually going to be looking at how the resolution of Game of Thrones could have been more satisfying, and uh, some things, some suggestions, just some suggestions about how that could have resolved better, because yeah, it's not going to work for Game of Thrones, but maybe it's something to consider when we get into the spin-off series. When we're talking about any kind of storytelling, I, I think there's a few things that we could do. So, let's fix the ending to Game of Thrones. That can't go badly. Oh, and in case you were wondering, yeah, we're going to have spoilers in this video, because if I need to explain how to fix an ending, I have to tell you about the ending. That's just kind of impossible not to do. So in order for the ending that we received for Game of Thrones to make more sense, uh, the big thing that we have to do is really increase time. So in the interest of giving it more time, season 7, instead of being 7 episodes, is 10. Which makes sense, the seasons should have been 10 episodes anyway, in order for you to do the story justice. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in Season 7, and it feels like the world gets very crunched down and condensed because people are going from, like, one corner of the map to another corner of the map in, like, a fraction of the time that it used to take. You go back to Season 1, and there was an entire episode where they were literally on the road. They were on the road between uh, King's Landing and Winterfell, I think the episode was actually called The King's Road, and there was a lot of drama and there was a lot of, you know, tension going on in that episode, but it is literally them traveling from one place to another. That was a whole episode of them getting there. So time really has to be spread out a little bit more to keep the epic scope of the world. So season seven, you had a whole party that went, like, north of the wall. So they're all up there in the winter wonderland that is you know, wildling country where the Night King and all of the Whites live. In, like, one episode, Gendry is able to, like, run back from north of the Wall, gets across the Wall, gets word to Daenerys, who's, like, in Dragonstone, and then Daenerys takes her dragons back up, like, by dawn. And it just makes the whole thing start to feel really rushed, which, of course, we're going to see a lot more of in 8. But I also feel like Season 7 really should have been the time where Jon learns about his lineage. Like, the stuff that happened in the first episode or two, some of that narrative stuff that happened in Season 8, really should have been in Season 7. And John should have found out about it, gives him a little bit of time to kind of process what is going on, what is happening with him. That would have been very beneficial. And I kind of feel like the end of Season 7 is when John comes out and explains this to Danny. And Daenerys has a look on her face like, oh no, this is bad. And then that's where season seven ends. So now when we get into season eight, we have a little bit of time to kind of flesh this out more before the Night King even shows up. Again, season eight, I'm seeing as ten episodes. Now that we have a lot of exposition out of the way that we kind of got out of the way in season seven, and hopefully some of the, you know, context for what's going to happen in 8, uh, we can now really look at the political maneuvering there, even before the White Walkers arrive. You know, maybe Daenerys is now starting to get a little bit more paranoid because Jon has told her this information and she has time to process it and determine what this actually means for her and her claim to the throne. And yeah, maybe this means that there's a little bit more distrust for her and it can eventually lead you to where her arc goes. Also needs more time for Tyrion to kind of go all in on Daenerys and maybe see that he doesn't really feel like Jon is a particularly good king. Maybe we can have those moments. Maybe we can have those moments where Arya like goes back and talks about when she was younger and she remembered she just wanted to see what was west of Westeros. Now we've gotten these things kind of set up for our eventual conclusion to this epic, but I think that the increased time also helps with some of the resolutions. Like, for instance, look at what happens with the Battle of Winterfell. 
okay, that should have been more than one episode. Like, I could have seen the Battle of Winterfell just going so badly, because it definitely looked like it was going badly. The most sensible thing, and really if we want to subvert expectations, which we've already talked about, they absolutely do, maybe they lose at Winterfell, and maybe they have to retreat from Winterfell. They have to fall back, because they just got their butts handed to them. They also probably at that point start wondering if it was a real good idea to have this fight in the middle of the night when you can't see anything. I can see them falling back further and further for like a couple episodes where it feels like the White Walkers are constantly on their heels. And in the meantime, Cersei's just kind of chilling out and hearing reports from the battlefield about, like, oh, yeah, see, this is why I didn't want to send troops out there. And now we're really seeing both the political side of it and the actual war. It's around this time, like, I was talking about the idea that Arya, instead of doing the leap of faith over a wall and, and like, just stabbing the Night King in the side, I think Arya can still be the one that takes out the Night King because, yeah, I, I get that. It doesn't have to be Jon, and it would probably be good if it wasn't Jon because that seems too set up. It seems too convenient that that would be the case. But maybe Arya does, like, slips away while everybody's running and determines that, yeah, I'm going to use all of my training. And you get to see her use her faceless powers. You get to see her use all of the tricks that she has come to learn over the course of the series in order to position herself exactly right, and then as they've fallen back and fallen back, and it looks like they're, you know, gaining on their heels, all of a sudden she comes out, like, from behind, just, you know, like that, and takes out the Night King, and then the army falls. But by this point, the army is practically, like, butting up against to where Cersei's territory is. So now, kind of like between a rock and a hard place. And that would be a really interesting thing. Like, now Cersei's got to ask questions about, like, oh, well, this is probably bad, but we can't really fight them, but we don't want them in our territory. It would, it would create a lot of interesting conflicts that wouldn't make it feel like, you know, the sub-boss battle and then the full-boss battle. Still, I feel like by episode 5, that's really, like, the conclusion to the Night King story. Like, about the halfway mark in the season, and we can kind of move our attention back on to who's actually going to take the throne. But of course, everybody by this point is a little bit more battle-weary. We've actually seen them in more combat. And again, I feel like Bran had some opportunities in this particular scenario where he could have proved to be a strategic thinker or to be like a commanding figure that would eventually mean that his influence is big enough that when he is made king at the end of the series, we have better context for it. Some things that would have to change around a little bit. For instance, uh, Daenerys doesn't lose her second dragon to some stray ballistas because dragons can go around ships. Because I feel like Euron and the Ironborn, after all their bravado of being so important, I just like the idea that they just get automatically trashed before they could do anything at all. She has the harbor, she has her troops, everything looks like it's going according to plan. There's been a lot more political machinations behind the scenes that have made her question things, that have made her question the loyalty of a lot of her advisors. But she's trying, and John, being the voice of reason that can actually provide that sort of reason to her now, is still in her court. And I can kind of understand that. That would make sense. You know, he was not going to give up that loyalty that easily, so now she can listen to him more. And maybe even Tyrion. Maybe Tyrion's not completely out of the doghouse by this point. It is at this point that Daenerys does not burn down King's Landing. No. I think she still has that expression like, this almost seething thing that kind of makes you think, like, the Mad Queen is in there, but it's not going to reveal itself yet, and she kind of recomposes herself, she, uh, she marches up to the Red Keep, and she finds Cersei, and probably Jamie by that point, too. Jamie's gotten to this point as well, uh, and, and the two of them come out, and she's, like, terrific, and she does the same thing that she did over in Essos. These are her political rivals. Uh, this is the queen that has usurped her throne, and this is the Kingslayer, the guy who killed her father. So, I sentence you to death, Dracarys, they get flame broiled, but they die together, still. 
they die together, but at Daenerys' hands. You can also have that really cool moment when Jamie's metal hand just melts away <laughs> in the dragon fire. That'd be pretty sweet. And I think it's at that point that Tyrion really ends up questioning some things. Sort of like how the Starks ended up turning against King's Landing and the Lannisters after Ned loses his head. Because it's that point where, oh, you're directly going after my family, and I did ask you not to do this. But Daenerys hasn't become so devoid of morals by that point that everybody just turns against her. She's going to try to rule as, you know, a calm and measured ruler. She's going to try to show that she is not Cersei, she is not her father, she is different. And that's episode 9, because traditionally episode 9 of Game of Thrones is, is like where a lot of stuff happens, and then episode 10 is extrapolate out what happened in episode 9. Traditionally, that's what happens. Episode 10, we get to see some of the political fallout and restructuring of all of this. And I actually think that this makes more sense. Daenerys has now taken the kingdom, the kingdom is still intact, and everything looks pretty good for her, and the small council gets established, which actually, I think, makes more sense for the small council. They're kind of the other characters that we all like. They're, they're, they're very likable characters, but I don't know why Bran would have picked them, but I can absolutely understand why Jon and Daenerys kind of working in tandem to start putting together small council would. Brian, Davos, uh, Samwell, definitely, because Samwell already has a good relationship with John and also has had an audience with Daenerys. So Daenerys knows who he is and knows his lineage and what happened. But again, I feel like all of those characters, we needed to explain why they ended up there. And I think it does a better job of that by having Daenerys and Jon setting that up. And then season eight ends with Daenerys sitting on the Iron Throne. And I know what you're saying. Oh, Nathan, I thought at the beginning of the video you said everybody is going to end up where, you, where they ended up in the actual show. Yes. Yes, they will. Because that gets us to season nine. Yeah, it, it really needed it. And I mean, it's not like HBO wouldn't have given it to them. They said that they wanted 10 seasons. They would have been pleased with 10 seasons. So nine would have been great. And here's the reason why I think nine would have been terrific. Because season eight ends with Daenerys on the throne. She sits down on the Iron Throne. She has everything she wants. She has a little bit of a smile. There's maybe a little bit of the crazy eye. Like she's finally gotten all the power that she ever wanted and more. And that's the end of season eight. Season nine, what does that actually mean for her? Because I see the start, the first five episodes of season nine, being Daenerys realizing that ruling Westeros is not the same as the kingdoms that she had back in Essos. That she cannot rule that way. And slowly but surely, she has a lot of questions lobbed at her. She is not able to rule out of love. She starts losing her grip. We have maybe a complete episode that goes back to her relationship with her father, which then foreshadows what eventually happens. Her relationship with John starts to break down more because it eventually would have anyway, and we start talking about what's going to happen with Winterfell, and Winterfell wants to be an independent state. Sansa, at the end of Game of Thrones, says, I insist that the North be a free state. So why not try to set that up better beforehand, that that is the end goal for the Starks, to free the North from the kingdoms of Westeros. Also in those first five episodes of the season nine, the, the imaginary season nine I've made, Jon's lineage has started to get out there, and people are really starting to find out about it now. And so rumors are circulating. Like the new Prince of Dorne, for instance, could have come in at this point and have been like, oh, well, you know, I hear that Jon Snow has a better claim to the throne. And all of this starts to weigh heavy on Daenerys's head. But she is still trying to play the humanitarian. And then 
I imagine that there is a part where she goes to, you know, settle a dispute in, like, some of the outer territories, uh, but it's actually some of the Lannister loyalists that have set up a trap. They have maybe some of the ballistas that they were able to acquire from King's Landing. You know, maybe maybe some of them were left over. They set up this trap a month or two after when she takes the throne. Uh, they fire it. They kill her other dragon. So now she's down to the one dragon. And it's at this point that I think Drogon just loses it because he sees his brother die right in front of him and he's in flame distance. So he spits out flame and he starts torching people and Daenerys hesitates to stop him. She's seeing people that are like civilians dying and she knows she doesn't like that but she's also really angry in that moment, and she's seeing that, and Drogon is there, and he has obviously decided that it is time to burn everything around him. And so, riding a weapon of mass destruction, she asks herself, do I want to stop this? And it's around that point that she kind of breaks and decides, no, you know what? Screw it. I can't run Westeros the way I ran Essos, so you know what? We're going to try this tactic now. It's at that point that she breaks, because it makes much more sense. We've had the time to show that she has tried the same tactic that she used before, and it failed here. Now, the later half of the season are, you know, the political machinations of all of those kingdoms coming together and saying, oh, we got a problem here and the small council starting to really ask if this is a good idea. Now their loyalties are all divided. People are still talking about how John should really be the king. That's what really should happen. Uh, you know, I see that the Unsullied and the Dothraki at that point are sort of torn in the middle of this. The Dothraki are horse lords. They don't like to necessarily sit still for long periods of time. Maybe the morale has had the time to kind of like dissipate uh, now that they've achieved everything that they want to achieve, you know, they're going to want to go off and start raiding and pillaging again, right? At some point, where are they going to do that? So things are starting to get into disarray. Daenerys realizes that this is really not what she thought it was going to be, and things just kind of go foobar. The kingdoms get together. Bran, uh, you know, proves to be better at being a diplomat. You know, I, I still say, if Bran eventually becomes the king, you have to set him up better for that. He is trying to actually do stuff at this point that shows to the other leaders, the noble houses of Westeros, why he is actually a pretty good leader. And it is during this time where Tyrion gives Jon that speech, probably in kind of a, like a cloak and dagger thing in King's Landing, where they realize this has gone too far. Now she's going to go off and attack all the other kingdoms. We have to stop this. And while all of her forces are out, maybe we just have to take Daenerys out. And then we eventually get to episode 9, we still have that scene. John goes into the throne room. He's trying, it's still intact. He's trying to get her to see reason and logic, but she has just gotten filled with rage and anger and frustration, and it has all started to crumble around her, and so she's going to try to make it crumble for real. Now her motivations seem a lot more genuine, and John's reaction also makes sense. There's just no other options. She goes up, and he stabs her, and she falls back, and you see the life go out of her eyes, and that, cut to black, that's the end of episode 9. Episode 10, again, is the fallout. And by this point, everything makes sense. Sansa wants the North to be free. We've already established that. We've reintroduced that Arya wants to go west of Westeros, that she's seen the rest of the world. We've started to flesh that out more. Bran gets installed as the king. Well, again, makes more sense if the other people around him at that point are familiar with who he is, and he has proven himself to be potentially a really good leader. 
Why is the small council set up that way? Because it wasn't set up under Bran. It was set up under John and Daenerys. So now they decide to keep the people who helped to bring this new order together. John's still accused of regicide, which means that it's probably going to be very hard for him to claim to be the king, and maybe he even voluntarily gives it up at that point. Helps out because at this point, I'm thinking that Grey Worm and the Unsullied and the Dothraki, most of her forces are literally just gone. Not because they got defeated, but they got spread out, uh, you know, trying to quell rebellions and people who didn't like that the political structure just got overhauled in a day. So they're out there trying to, you know, put out fires, herd cats, so when John eventually goes up and, and assassinates her, it makes more sense that he makes it out of there alive and that they basically pass sentence on him before Grey Worm probably even finds out. As for Drogon, I kind of think that the whole illusion where Bran was saying, oh, maybe I can find him, maybe Bran literally just wargs into Drogon toward the end and says, hey, Drogon, uh, you have to leave now, go away. And he, he just goes off into the distance, which would also kind of reinforce it's pretty sweet to have a king who, if a dragon is going to come back to attack, he can just kind of like warg into him and say, turn around, turn around. Again, kind of reinforcing why people might think it's a good idea for him to be the king. If he can turn a dragon around and have him go off into the sunset whenever, that's a pretty useful skill for a king to have. And I feel like instead of Drogon just melting the Iron Throne, because dragons understand how symbolism works, apparently. <laughs> I kind of see the people of King's Landing, maybe even all the noble houses, collectively taking, like, hammers and destroying the Iron Throne, because we have literally done what Daenerys originally set out to do, but realized that she couldn't really do herself, which is break the wheel. And so you get to see that moment where the people conscientiously decide, we don't want this throne anymore. So Bran takes up the mantle. The small council is still the small council. Jon does go back to the wall. Uh, it makes more sense that he got out at that point. And yeah, he goes off into the wildlings territory. Uh, again, I think thematically that makes sense. The very first scene of Game of Thrones is someone running from the wintry north back to Winterfell, it kind of makes sense that the last scene is still John on horseback heading into the Northern Wilds. And it still makes sense and is still poetically thematic that Bran falls out of a window at the very beginning of the show and then ascends to a king. And Jaime and Cersei start being on top of the world in that tower in episode one. And then they end up being ashes, dust to dust. Daenerys thought that she could escape being the Mad Queen and tried her hardest to not be like the other Targaryens. And then when she realized that her options are exhausted, reverts back to being the Targaryen people worried she would be. John, at the start of the series, didn't want anything political. He had no political aspirations. And I can imagine that it makes more sense for him that he doesn't even want to be the king if he's seeing Daenerys, who he swore would be a good queen before all of this, and finding out that she can't even make it work the way she wants to would completely turn him off of the idea. All the principal characters of Game of Thrones still end where the show ended them. However, by having a full season 7 and 8, and having that season 9, where we really get to see essentially the decline for Daenerys, her descent, as she realizes that this has all gone wrong, would have done so much more to make that story plausible. But what do I know? I mean, I just watch stuff. I don't write stuff. And I don't want to. For the record, I don't want to. I know there's been a lot of criticism that went around on, on D&D and Betty Off and Weiss and, and that they took it into a direction. And yeah, it feels like they rushed through the last couple seasons of Game of Thrones. But I am not going to discount that 
up to that last part where it felt very rushed, they were doing a pretty darn good job, and screenwriting is not the same as writing. Even though you have some base material to work with, even if you are adapting a story, you can still take it in a bunch of bad directions. Just think of the number of movies where it was based on a book, so they had a previous source material, and then the movie was terrible. Can't think of one at the moment, but you know, if you can, leave it in the comments below. Twilight? Oh no, that assumes Twilight was good to begin with. Yeah, maybe I can't think of one. Howard the Duck. It was a comic book. That counts, right? The point is, writing a show is hard, and you know, running a show is especially hard. And I would not want to do that either. It's just way too stressful. And that documentary that they did really just reinforced that there were so many people that put their heart and soul into making that show the best it could possibly be, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are saddened when it doesn't feel like it wrapped up particularly well, because endings in stories are so hard, and it's usually a place where a lot of epics, especially long-time series, falter. I totally get why Martin has taken his sweet time on those last books, because... Man, you know, you can plot through several books, you can plot through a lot of story, and it can get really great, and then when you start to realize, oh, this has to come to a conclusion at some point, that's when things really get intense. You then have to really start thinking, oh, I've put a lot of story threads in here. What happened with Azora High? We didn't really get a resolution to that. What was what going on with the Lord of Light? Don't really know. Those are things that, again, could have been fleshed out with a little bit more time, and unfortunately, we just we just didn't get that. All right, everyone. Well, this was probably a pretty pointless exercise, I know, because it's not like they're going to go back and redo the entire ending of Game of Thrones, uh, and nor should they. I don't really think they should. Uh, let it be what it is. Uh, and, you know, maybe when they do a spin-off series, maybe when we get these other epics that they are putting out there, like when we get The Witcher and such, they will just take this as an important piece of feedback that... Maybe they should be plotting out the ending of the show when they start the show. Thank you for watching Vlogging Camp, and don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe, because you, you know that I'm probably going to end up doing uh, more of these. It's not going to be about Game of Thrones. This is like literally the only thing I plan on doing ever on Game of Thrones. There are other topics in, in movies, video games, television, media in general, uh, like a whole bunch of stuff that I want to talk about. All right, until next time, if there is a next time to be continued, maybe. That was a terrible ending. Why did I give advice at all? I don't know. I have another deck of the playing cards. One second here. Okay, so I'm realizing that this deck also doesn't really work because I'm missing so many principal characters that were apparently not very important back in 2014 when this deck was made. Like, for instance, the Lannisters I'm all set with. I got Tyrion, I got Cersei, and I have Jaime. Okay, so I'm all set with those. Plus, check it out, King and Queen. Da, 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 da. There we go. Danny and John. But I have no other Starks. <laughs> None of them. Grey Worm. I got a Grey Worm. And then check out the other Jacks. Look, that's basically the Small Council now. Isn't that great? Literally, do not remember his name.